Bob is a visionary. Bob has big hair and he has really big ideas. He believes in people and he believes that you can do great things. It was because of what Bob did on the 110 freeway. LA has not been the same since. Bob's an organizer first and foremost. Working with Bob and having him as a professor directly influenced my decision to do this work. The major themes in my life have really been about bringing about change, social change in different forms. I grew up in Brooklyn uh, from a progressive family. I was fortunate to get a full scholarship to Reed College, so off I went to Portland, Oregon, 3,000 miles away. He had the ability to get work done. He was very capable of harnessing his energies. I decided to go abroad in my junior year, and I actually explored on my own a program in Strasbourg in France. I became engaged with uh, a group called the International Situationists. What it provided really was the kind of uh, cultural critique that became part of my transition to really being part of the new left. And they d had the slogan called All Power to the Imagination. That idea that uh, to make the kind of breakthroughs we need requires a sense of possibility, of imagination. When I graduated from Reed, it was 1965, um, I went back to New York. My identity was became immediately connected to Students for a Democratic Society, SDS. Bob was working on setting up an organization called the Movement for a Democratic Society. We created a group called the Urban Underground, whose first action was parading around the Port Authority building saying, we want to ban cars in Manhattan. Part of our uh, self-invented mission was to organize on behalf of the interests of working people and poor people. It was really the first time I began to s talk about an environmental politics as well. The U.S. involvement in Vietnam was escalating. The nature of the demonstrations was changing. No more demonstrations on behalf of affordable housing. Now we were, uh, as it goes, smashing the state. Even as the huge numbers of people wanting to identify with whether it was anti-war politics or feminist politics or the outgrowth of the civil rights movement, the organizational form of the new left was collapsing. Bob left New York and moved to LA in 69 and immediately started sending messages back to everybody he knew in New York saying, this is great, you gotta come here. Everybody should come and see this place. I started uh, both working in with environmental groups in LA and helping create some new ones, still working around the anti-Vietnam War movement. And so coming from New York to LA was not so much an escape, but thinking, is LA a place of possibility? And what is its history? Does it have a history? Does it have a hidden history? Until Bob wrote Thinking Big, his book about the Los Angeles Times, there was no story uh, that anybody had told before about the power of the Los Angeles Times. And that book made uh, Bob, uh, you know, prominent. The dominant history of L.A., which was so associated with the Chandler family that ran the L.A. Times for four generations, everything from the founding of the port in San Pedro to the L.A. aqueduct and bringing the water to L.A. Harry Chandler was the guy who really put it together. He put together the land deals in the valley. The major conflict, of course, was using the newspaper to promote the, those land deals. But they also profited from the land because it turned the dry old valley into, into something that made them a fortune. The famous slogan of Mulholland, William Mulholland, the engineer who was central to it, here is the water, take it. Well, who took it? And how did it get used? I'd put it on a higher level than journalism. I'd, I'd say it was history. Peter Wiley and I did the book on the West and on resource issues and again water and energy were really central to how the West was shaped. We decided that we would look at six cities in the West that were um, in the arid parts of the West and what it took to develop them. San Francisco and Los Angeles but also Phoenix and Salt Lake City and Denver and um, Las Vegas. A very close relationship between the federal government 
and major corporations was necessary for the construction of cities in an arid climate. We also discovered that those cities had strong influences through the Mormon church. So that spun off a second book on uh, sort of the politics and power of the Mormon church. There was a bestseller in Salt Lake City. Las Vegas was a, essentially a Mormon community. When Meyer Lansky and Bugsy Siegel showed up after the war and built it into a, a, a mafia paradise, the, the Mormons were there. And not only were they there, they were very powerful um, politically. They could have people um, owning some of the banks and the casinos, but they didn't want people working on the floors, touching the dice. So we called a column we did together, Just Don't Touch the Dice. He wrote it at a, at a pace I can't write at. He's also the master of the run-on sentence. I ended up being the rewrite guy. What I will always remember was Bob uh, being a member of the Metropolitan Water District Board. This was the most powerful, secretive, influential, waspish, old guy governing body around here. Incredible power. The focus was so much on this notion that you needed to continually find distant sources of water to increase the supply in order for people to deal with growth. That was reaching a point where uh, it wasn't going to work anymore. He was this lefty guy with absolutely no respect for his distinguished old fathead colleagues. People feel that they can, uh, you know, that it's an honor to be appointed and that their role is basically to support uh, what the general manager and the management want to do. Bob felt that he was a director, and as a director, he was not called upon to be docile or doting. The mission of the water agency really needs to be thinking about what are the health issues, what are the environmental issues, what are the land use issues. We are continually in cycles of dry years and not so dry years or wet, wet years. So those dry years are a permanent part of your, your cycle. His ideas are more really very mainstream now. I worked with Bob at UCLA for a couple of years and um, it was the period in which he was launching a whole bunch of projects and initiative around food systems, around cleaner, dry cleaning. The students were interested in looking at environmental questions as they related to the campus. And so they undertook what became the very first campus environmental audit, how much waste was being generated, how much water and energy was being used. The LA Times got a hold of the story. The headline was this notion that UCLA discovers pollution itself. The dean called me that morning. He said, the chancellor woke me up at five in the morning saying, your students got us on the front page of the LA Times. That kind of went berserk. And I thought, you know, at Oxy, we love controversy. We love getting students involved in social action. Um, we're not as uptight as uh, they were at UCLA. We thought that Oxy would welcome Bob with open arms, and we have. UEPI was an action research center, and a staff, everything from organizers to people who were saw themselves as kind of doing a postdoc in community organizing. So in 1999, we, we did this LA River program, it went on for a year, and one of the programs we had was to talk about this stream and say, well, it's channelized, how do you really rethink the Arroyo Seco, uh, as well as all the different components of the LA River itself. We started to realize that the river was a construct, not just an architectural an engineering concept, but a cultural concept. First, I had to convince people that the river even existed. Really looking at how the Los Angeles River could be reimagined in LA, um, from being an eyesore and something that was somewhat a, a divider of communities, to something that could be an ecological, a recreational resource. So we had 40 events in a, a year. Culminating with the first uh, a public debate on the future of the Los Angeles River, which was conducted ad Occidental. 
and grew several hundred people. One of the, it was really a groundbreaking moment for Friends of the Los Angeles River. How do you uh, really make this a different kind of place? One that celebrates the sense of connection to our environment. A few years later, some of the same people who were thinking about the re-envisioning the Arroyo Seco and re-envisioning the LA River said, well, what about the freeway? The poet William Carlos Williams once wrote that a new world is a new mind. What Bob did with that piece was to create a new mind. So we had this event called Arroyo Fest where we decided we would get to close the freeway, to have a bike ride and a walk on the freeway. Part of the idea was to show that you could actually bike the freeway faster than you would drive the freeway. He considers Arroyo Fest to be a type of kind of magical urbanism. It's the idea there's this hidden sense of possibility in our everyday environment. Four or five thousand people who participated. It was a Sunday morning early but it was a transformative event. This was not Photoshop, this was real. And this creates a way of thinking that all power of the imagination has a basis in reality. These Brussels sprouts are really coming along. And most children here have never had these and, and we find delightful ways to prepare them so that they decide, hey, they're pretty good. We, we start our lessons here, and then they do uh, tasks out in the garden to keep it going. We connect garden and nature to every subject that's taught in the LA Unified School District. All this food that the student, students have planted and have maintained, watered, eventually ends up in their stomachs. Bob was the inspiration for all this. Uh, getting uh, food from the farm to the school. For Bob, social justice and food access really go hand in hand. We use the term food justice as a kind of a central organizing principle, how food is grown and access to food and issues around uh, control over the food that you eat all became part of the agenda. It was becoming evident that, that the food system in South, South Central LA just wasn't working. Um, was, wasn't meeting people's needs. We produced a massive report in the spring of 93 that got uh, the LA Times attention. It led to him working on farm to school issues. It led to really the coalescence of the whole food movement, really. Thank you. My daughter confronted me one day and said, nothing to say negative things about Rodney, but she didn't like this, the food in the school. She said, well, why don't you do something like you're doing but bring it to my school. So I made an appointment to see Rodney one day. Bob came in one day and wanted to meet and his question was what if? And um, quite simply, what if we bought our produce from the local farmer's market? So he said, okay, we'll, we'll try it for a week and we'll see if your kids really, uh, the kids in the school really are uh, gonna be trying out a farmer's market salad bar. I knew hunger far more intimately than I cared to discuss. And the truth of the matter, these were issues I had buried. And Bob brought them up. But we had the ability to really engage with the kids. There was a school garden. We started talking to them about, you know, the food you taste in the garden could be the food you could taste in the cafeteria. And so that very first day, three quarters of the kids went to the, to the salad bar. <laughs> How cool is that? As a pilot project in Santa Monica in 97, that in 2015 we would be talking about a program that's in all 50 states and in over 2,000 school districts. A kid at a school anywhere in Los Angeles now understands that they have the right to eat the best quality food that's not only good for their bodies, but is also good for the environment. UEPI has uh, enhanced the reputation of Occidental in several ways. One, it's brought visibility in part through Bob's, uh, not only through Bob's leadership, but also through uh, 
uh, his writing and his research and his policy work. Bob um, had this way of moving beyond oppositional politics to a politics that was a visionary politics. Bob's students are his legacy, who've been involved in the environmental and food justice and labor and other movements all over Los Angeles and all over the country. Our students are great. I mean, they're problem solvers. We like to say um, they're idealists, but they're practical idealists. So they have vision, they have passion about changing the world, and now they have the tools. The UEPI has had a tremendous impact on my life. Professionally, it was the beginning of what I think will be a long career doing the work that UEPI does and, and supports its students in doing. He helps inspire people that there is this joy in social change and that is a valuable lesson at an early age for the students and it's also I think a good thing for us as staff to be reminded. Bob likes to look at this next phase of his life as a transition. Some people might call it a retirement but for him it's a transition and I think that we'll be seeing a lot of Bob still around Los Angeles. One of the ways I think about my role and my contribution is to try and really understand the dynamic of uh, what needs change. Change is possible. Uh, and to have that optimism of the will uh, and explore it. I think of myself as actually wanting to make life and make history. That's who I was and that's who I continue to be.